as I prayed about today's sermon, God laid on my heart a desire to speak into uh, and to seek to help all of us process from Scripture uh, the, the pain and the brokenness that our nation is presently experiencing. We have continued to lament the unjust deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. Uh, as you know, in response to ethnic injustice and racism and uh, police mistreatment and brutality, there are currently protests, most of them peaceful, uh, taking place throughout the country. There has also been rebellion and rioting and violence. Uh, more people have died protesters and police officers have been shot, thousands have been arrested, and there have been millions of dollars in property damage to buildings and businesses. You may have noticed in your relational network that we are not all processing these events the same way. Our life experience shapes our perspective, and that's part of why we need each other, to listen and to learn and to grow. Uh, you may have also noticed there is so much coming at us during these times, endlessly scrolling videos with no context, commentary from every possible political view, uh, events unfolding and interacting in real time across the country and around the world, and all of that happening during a time where there is an unprecedented global pandemic and economic crisis. So if you find yourself confused, if you find yourself conflicted, I'm with you. We are with you. And I'm here today, and you're tuned in today, because we are convinced that our contribution to addressing the world's problems cannot be found by letting the world's take on truth rule the day. We need truth from God. We need the perspective that comes from the eternal, authoritative, penetrating, Christ-exalting Word of God. We are desperate for a word from the Lord. And so our sermon text will be found in several verses in Ecclesiastes verses, uh, chapters 3 through 5. And our sermon title is The Violation of Justice and the Hope Jesus Brings. We'll begin reading in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 16. This is God's holy and authoritative word. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. And in chapter 4, Verse 1, again I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought the dead who are already dead more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been born and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. And one more verse, chapter 5, verse 8. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter. For the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. May God bless the preaching of his word. 
sociologist Jonathan Kozul once met a woman named Mrs. Washington who lived in a homeless hotel with her son in the South Bronx. Mrs. Washington lived a challenging life, and during their visit, she shared stories of those difficulties. She shared stories of poverty and injustice, stories of drugs and violence and rape. There were children in her building born with AIDS. Uh, there was the 12-year-old who was hit by a stray bullet at the bus stop and was paralyzed. She talked about the physical abuse that she received from her husband. She described the difficulties poor people had getting medical care in the city. During one visit, that sociologist, Mr. Kozul, saw that Mrs. Washington's Bible was open on the quilt next to her as she spoke. He asked what part of the Bible she liked to read. You know how she answered that question? She said, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. And then she said, if you want to know what's happening these days, it's all right there. Many of us want to know what's happening these days. Well, it is all right here. How should we think about the many sorrows and injustices in our world today and throughout history? What about when we ourselves are sinned against and mistreated? If you want to know what is happening these days, it is all right here. This book of Ecclesiastes speaks so powerfully to the pain of our nation. It speaks to the evil, the oppression, and the violation of justice that surrounds all of humanity this side of Genesis 3. I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. The writer of Ecclesiastes says that he sees the many tears of the oppressed. He hears their wails and their cries. He looks at the world and he sees that so often certain groups of people are mistreated, that laws are not enforced with equity. In fact, the depravity of humanity is so great, he observes in chapter 3, verse 16, that even the place of justice is at times unjust. And friends, this is true in every century and across the nations. The people and systems that are supposed to be the places we turn to receive justice and protection at times end up being wicked and tragically unfair. In fact, this truth is embedded in the events of the gospel. For this is exactly what happened to our Savior. Justice was aborted. And Jesus was criminally crucified by the very ones charged to uphold justice and law. Chapter 316 could be translated, the place of judgment, injustice was there. The place of righteousness, injustice was there. One commentator said it is as if the outrage outpaces his ability to articulate words. And so if you've been there in recent weeks, the outrage outpacing the ability to articulate words. Friends, you are not alone. In recent days, we have all seen what the writer of Ecclesiastes sees. Don't close your eyes to it. Don't minimize it or treat it as rare in this world. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter. Following the news of recent injustice and racism toward African Americans, I confess that I was shocked. I was surprised. I was amazed at the matter. An unarmed black man jogging through a Georgia neighborhood is chased down by racist men. He changes directions. He tries to escape, but he is trapped and then shot and killed. 
a district attorney decides there is no reason for anyone to be arrested, and the men walk free for months. I was talking with Jared Torrance about this. He ran the 2.23 miles in honor of Ahmad while listening to a lament playlist he made called Do We Matter? And after that run, he said that he sat down and wept. One of the things that JT told me that stood out to me and that I remember, he said that while he is deeply grieved, he is not surprised. And his response in not being amazed at the matter was wiser than mine and reflects a biblical worldview of human depravity. I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And friends, the, when, you, when you take it in, not just recent events, but, but take in all the oppressions that are done under the sun, the injustice of this lost and wretched world would be unbearably depressing. It would be disillusioning for us all were it not for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The message of Ecclesiastes, what you have here, basically, this is Ecclesiastes. The world is messed up, and God is our only hope. The author tells the story of his quest for satisfaction. He surveys life under the sun, that phrase used more than 30 times in the book, to refer to the world in its present fallen state. He is not pessimistic, as he first may seem. He is writing to help us find our satisfaction in God and to place our hope in God. He is writing that our hearts might ache and long for a world of perfect justice that is far different than our own. Philip Reich, in speaking of the hope that we have in Christ, says this. He says, remember this whenever you get frustrated, sad, angry, or disappointed with everything in life that is getting broken, falling apart, and going wrong. Okay, here's a word for the frustrated, sad, angry, and disappointed. Remember this. He says, remember this when you feel overwhelmed, and are tempted to wonder why you should even bother. You were made for a new and better world. The very fact that you are weary of this life is pointing you to Jesus as the only one who can satisfy your soul. There's a lot that I have to say today from the Word of God. But ultimately, I have one goal in this sermon, and that is to point us to Jesus Christ as our only hope and as the only one who can satisfy our souls. May Christ be exalted in a world of injustice. And so with our tear-filled eyes fixed on this glorious Savior, fixed on Christ, and with tired souls, sustained by the hope of the gospel. Let me give three ways that we can process these things biblically. We'll spend most of our time on the first two points. First, let's discern the presence of biblical injustice. Let's discern the presence of biblical injustice. We've talked about what justice means in the Bible before from this pulpit in the Bible, the idea of justice includes not only fair laws and the punishment of wrongdoers, it also includes loving and defending the vulnerable, giving to the needy, resisting the temptation to, to rule and dominate others, and treating people fairly with kindness and with respect. It has to do with our actions and with our words and with the kind of world that exists. Ultimately, biblical justice has to do with the restoration of all creation and all relationships 
in all of society according to God's glorious design. That, of course, will not be realized until Christ returns. But in the meantime, God, who alone is perfectly just, has created a people in Christ to reflect his heart for justice. We are called to make a difference in the world, to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with our God. And if we are going to make a difference and be a people of justice, we first need to join with the writer of Ecclesiastes in discerning the presence of injustice in the world. How can we cultivate this skill as a people of discerning biblical injustice? We start, perhaps unexpectedly, we start with our own failures of justice. We don't point our fingers at the world as if we ourselves have perfectly maintained God's high standard of justice, right? The message of Christianity is not those sinners over there need a savior more than I do. G.K. Chesterton was once asked by a major newspaper, you may have heard before, he posed this question, what is the problem with the world? And the question was sent to many leading intellectuals to reply with long essays about everything that is wrong with the world. Chesterton is reported to have responded with a simple handwritten note that answered that question, what's wrong with the world, with two words. I am. Sincerely yours, Chesterton. We start with ourselves. When we see an officer sin against someone, or when we see others in society then respond in sin, that is an opportunity not only to pray for the repentance of those guilty of severe injustices, which we ought to do, not only to cry out for and to seek justice, which we ought to do, but also it is an opportunity for us to humbly confess the more subtle sin that we have harbored in our own hearts toward others, the way we have all sinned against those we disagree with, those who are different from us, those who vote for the other party. We should seek to humbly acknowledge that we have room to grow. We should suspect our own potential for prejudice and injustice. We should turn away from the sin of partiality. One of the things that I am so encouraged by is the humble self-reflection that I see happening in our church family these days. One brother reached out to me to acknowledge his wrong thoughts and attitudes toward the pain and sorrow that many African Americans are experiencing. Two other members of the church, one black, one white, apologized to each other for failing to communicate graciously and respectfully with each other around issues of race. Friend, when it, friends, when it comes to each one of us, when it comes to living justly, get rid of self-righteousness, get rid of defensiveness and argumentativeness, and let there be contrition, let there be repentance, let there be growth and change which are pleasing in the sight of God. We start with ourselves. And in this way, we are a voice in the world that is not a self-righteous voice, but is a voice of humility and truth that can speak to issues of justice. And from there, if we are informed by Scripture, we then must go on to consider injustice in the world around us. And as you take that step, this is important, don't limit the justice issues you care about to the concerns of your preferred political party. That's important because there are areas of biblical justice that neither party appears especially passionate about. And because these issues of ethnicity, oppression, injustice, these do not fit neatly into contemporary political alignments or ideologies. Tim Keller has some really helpful thoughts uh, at this point. He shares this in, uh, in his preface, uh, the, the foreword that he wrote for uh, John Piper's book, Bloodlines. And what Keller says is that, here's what we have going on in our culture. He says, many have made racism and ethnic prejudice virtually the only thing they will call a sin. Right? The idea that everyone is a racist and that's all that people are calling out. 
And he says they often lay the guilt for that sin of racism at the doorstep of those who are social conservatives. And he explains that because of that, uh, many who identify themselves as conservatives simply don't want to hear about racism anymore. And he says uh, they give lip service to it being a sin, but they associate any sustained denunciation of racism with liberal or secular systems of thought. That cultural dynamic and climate create massive challenges for the pastor or anyone who seeks to speak into these things. As pastors, we are not addressing these issues on a conservative, progressive spectrum. That framework assumes the politicization of these issues, which is the very thing we seek to avoid in the pulpit. Here's something, so I want to encourage you, everything that you hear, let's move off of that spectrum of how does this sound politically into the realm of how does this align with the truth of God's word. Here's something else. If you want to be skilled at discerning the presence of injustice, be sure to give special attention to the category of power and the abuse of power. This is a whole sermon in and of itself that I will just mention briefly. Chapter 4, verse 1. On the side of their oppressors, there was power. Now, you may be aware, some people teach that all of humanity can be divided into groups of the oppressed and the oppressor, and that these categories play a fundamental role in our identity. There are, are secular theories that say, if you are white, or if you are a police officer, uh, if you have power or privilege in any way, then you are the oppressor. That way of thinking is not only wrong, it is dangerous and unbiblical. At the same time, the Bible affirms the reality of oppression. In fact, oppression is a major category of suffering in Scripture, and sadly, it is too often downplayed and ignored by Christians. And so we need to rethink power and oppression and authority. <coughs> power and authority are not intrinsically bad. They are intended by God to be a gift and a blessing. And we, all of us, thank God for the countless men and women in law enforcement who heroically sacrifice to serve us, who use their power in just ways. The Christian cannot buy into the anti-authority spirit of our age. Romans 13.1 says governing authorities have been instituted by God. And yet, and this is what we want to hear, Scripture repeatedly testifies to the way power is easily abused. You will see this in uh, statements it, throughout biblical narratives, but you'll see it in commands given to parents, commands given to pastors and those who have spiritual authority, and ways that those who govern society are to rule. It testifies to the ways that power is so easily abused and when national leaders and those in law enforcement do wrong, whether speaking or acting in ways that are not just, it is a uniquely harmful abuse of justice, and it ought to be recognized and grieved as such. One other thought on discerning the presence of injustice, and that is to examine the impact of sin on the structures of society. Here is something that is true in any culture. Injustice works its way not only into each individual, which it does, but also into the structures of society so that institutions often fall short of true justice. We see this in the institutions of marriage and families, in business, in governments, in laws, in criminal justice systems, in churches, in the media, and more. There are structures that can profoundly contribute to perpetuating injustice of many kinds. And in fact, it needs to be said, if you take a strictly individualistic approach to justice, because I think this, it's best to think this through in terms of an area that you already feel deeply about. Um, that's where we tend to be able to see most clearly the obvious structural issues. 
for the purposes of this sermon, let's take an example like abortion or pornography. If you take a strictly individualistic approach to justice, if you think only in terms of individual choices in each person's heart and don't consider the structures of society, we won't always have the clearest view of the problem or the path to justice. Now, I'm not suggesting in saying this that it's the role of the church as the church to affect change in every societal structure. And we never want to emphasize structural issues to the detriment of the individual. The point, the point is simply that those who understand justice according to Scripture will know that injustice is often caused by larger factors that are more complicated than an individual's choice, and that needs to be a part of discerning the presence of injustice in a fallen world. There's more to be said under this point as it relates to particular forms of injustice, but it will wait for a future time. That's first, first step. We become skilled at discerning the presence of of injustice. And then second, second point, let's mourn injustice with biblical empathy. Do I have a tissue up here? Can someone hook me up with a tissue? Let's mourn injustice with biblical empathy. Thank you. And we see this in Ecclesiastes and in our text. Ecclesiastes 7.2 says, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. And chapter 7 verse 4 says, The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. Chapter 3 verse 4 says, There is a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, which we read, we have this gut-wrenching lament where in his reflection he goes so far as to envy the dead and the unborn because they are spared the misery and the evil that surrounds us in a fallen world. In chapter 4, verse 1, when the author sees the brokenness of the world, there's this tragic moment where he longs for someone to comfort the oppressed, for someone to comfort the victims of injustice. And he repeats twice that tragic refrain, a reality that adds to the sorrow of the afflicted. They had no one to comfort them. So he not only laments the events themselves, he laments the absence of comforters. Who will enter their sorrow? Who understands their pain? Who will respond with empathy and tears? Who will go to the house of mourning? A biblically informed sociology is deeply empathetic. Let this be a mark of our lives and a mark of Covenant Fellowship Church. Empathy. We do not follow talking heads and caustic pundits. We follow the gentle and lowly one. We follow the one who saw crowds and had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. And we are the people of Christ with his spirit of gentleness and compassion in us. In the church, we are called to be a people of compassion who comfort one another, who weep with those who weep. And I thank God that I see so many of you doing this very thing. Empathy. Empathy is more important than we know. Empathy is something much deeper than Twitter and Instagram activism, which lasts for a few weeks and is gone. There are scars that outlast trending hashtags. And so empathy leans toward others in love. Empathy will not minimize one issue of justice by changing the subject or saying another justice issue is more important. Empathy understands that there are enough instances of white officers misusing authority to make 
law-abiding black men fearful. We must learn empathy. We've got people showing up at the house of mourning, handing out statistics and saying, well, actually. Like, really? That's how you're going to roll? It's not empathy. We need to do better. Empathy takes the time to learn, to be present, to genuinely grieve, to pray, to let hurting brothers and sisters know that what they say matters because they matter. As a church family, we want to be marked not only by empathy, but empathy, hear this, for all who are impacted by injustice. Uh, those who are unjustly treated on all sides of every issue. And my guess is that for us, empathy in some places comes easier than empathy in other places. I spoke to an African-American brother in the church, a doctor, who spent time in his decade-long, decades of medical career. Uh, he spent time treating police officers injured in the line of duty in Camden. And he said to me, I spoke with him on the, on the phone, he said that officers go to work not knowing if they will come home to their families. He said they heroically risk their lives to serve and protect. And what he understands is that many police officers, many good police officers will suffer unfairly because of the brutal actions done by an officer elsewhere in the country, actions that so many officers themselves condemn. If you understand that, you have cultivated the loving skill of placing yourself in the shoes of another. You have empathy. When David Dorn small town police chief in St. Louis is fatally and unjustly shot as he tries to stop others from looting. What do we do? We lament. We go to the house of mourning. We walk in empathy. This empathy, empathetic mourning, needs to be applied to all those whose lives are unjustly taken. Too often when there is a shooting, we fall into this awful way of thinking that says, well, the victim has my sympathy to the degree that he was a good guy. Friends, that way of thinking is out of step with the gospel and with biblical justice. When it comes to how image bearers are treated, and when an image bearer is treated unjustly, and especially when a life is taken, we go to the house of mourning. We give great respect to all men and women because they are made in the image of God. Don't let your care and concern rise and fall based off of his record or his character. We must learn empathy. We must learn the heart of Christ. We must learn to lament. And I could highlight many different areas of injustice to lament. Inevitably, when we speak into these issues, because they are so politicized, people will raise questions about balance and what about this issue and what about that issue. Hear me. Don't assume that there are issues of biblical justice that I don't care about because I'm focusing in on one particular injustice here. Today, I do want to highlight one particular injustice that the Church of Christ in America must be sure to lament, and that is injustice toward black and brown-skinned people. Here's the way to think about this. If any nation demeans and dehumanizes a particular ethnicity for hundreds of years, owning them as property, creating laws that prohibit them from flourishing, teaching the lie of white superiority, even in the church, which happened in the history of our nation. If you have that, it should not be surprising if the impact of that racial injustice is multi-generational experienced economically and psychologically for decades to come. Nor should it be surprising 
if traces of that ethnic prejudice continue to find expression in the hearts of future generations. John Piper says this to pastors. This is in his book, Brothers, We Are Not Professionals. It's a book written for pastors, but he has a chapter in there on the necessity for pastors to speak to issues of racism and ethnic prejudice. And he says this to pastors, it doesn't matter whether your church is in Mississippi or Minnesota, your people are tinged by racism, to put it softly. He says, time passes swiftly, memories are long, and we have not come very far in the heart. This is the great evil that reigned in America for centuries. Friends, have, do you realize it? Have you grieved it? Do you, do you understand what our nation has done? Who can calculate the damage wrought by the degradation of black men and women? How long will law-abiding black men be viewed as a threat how long will many black parents have to carefully and fearfully instruct their sons how to respond to authority in ways that make them less likely to be shot? How long will many African Americans have to endure insensitive comments that are dismissive of their pain? How long will our churches remain so largely divided by ethnicity? Who will gain wisdom? Who will understand these things? Who will go to the house of mourning? And I do want to, to say this. One of the pastors who looked at my notes said, tell them that a hard word is coming. This may be a hard word. To my white brothers and sisters, we have a Christian obligation to recognize those who belong to an ethnic group that has been historically mistreated in our nation. We have an obligation to recognize them and to make sure we treat them justly. Much as we have a special obligation to extend love and respect to the widow and the poor, the handicapped and the sick, the elderly and the unborn, foreigners and minorities. You cannot say, well, his skin color is irrelevant to me. You, or, don't make this about ethnicity. Listen, if, let me put it like this. If you are white and a black man jogs by your home in Georgia, or if you are a white police officer and your knee is on the black man's neck while he is handcuffed and he says he can't breathe, God have mercy. You have an obligation in this country that includes recognizing the color of his skin and saying, given the sad history of this nation and the legacy of white supremacy and racism against African Americans that stains that history, I am under heightened obligation before God to give special attention to treating this man with the justice and respect that is his due as one who bears the image of God. If someone looks at a black man in his neighborhood and says, get the guns, let's chase him down, it is an appalling injustice across ethnic lines. If a police officer keeps his knee on a man's neck for 8 minutes and 46 seconds, it is not only evil in a general way, it is also in evil in the realm of ethnic justice and love. And it is in alignment with and continuation of the history of that devastating sin in America. Don't say, keep color out of it. No, we have an obligation to acknowledge the historic lies of racism, to recognize ethnic differences, and to choose with all our hearts, with all of our passion, to choose ethnic harmony and love. Friends, this is not complex. This should not be controversial. 
But my fear is that some are so seeped in cultural noise that all they hear when things like this are spoken are political statements. I am not making political statements. These are matters of biblical justice. The victims of sin are shedding tears, experiencing the violation of justice, and God forbid that there should be no one to comfort them. For many, I know your hearts break over these things. For all of us, friends, I plead with you, let's go together to the house of mourning. That is where the wise are. That is where the people of Christ should be. I want to take a moment to address African-American friends who are hurting. I've heard from a number of you, and I'm so grateful that you have reached out. I know there is not one African-American way of processing these things. We never want to presume that if you are a particular ethnicity, you will think and feel a certain way. But I do want to address those African-Americans and really any ethnic minorities who are hurting because I know there is hurt. And I want to thank you for being a part of this church family. We've learned from you. We love you. Thank you for the love and the forbearance that you show. I know I speak for the entire church family when I say that we want to be a source of comfort. We want to be with you in the house of mourning. And it, it grieves me that I know that I will fall short. We know that we will fall short of the love and care that God calls us to. And I want to remind you even more than our love of the love that God has for you and of his care that will never fail. Because When human comforters fail, as will inevitably be the case, we want to remember that we have God as the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. And as a Christian, it will never be true that there is no one to comfort you. That cry of there being none to comfort, there being no one to comfort, I thank God that for all who are in Christ, it cannot be said, for Christ has made you his own. And the more weary and distraught we are, the more abandoned we may feel by others, the more disappointed we may be with community, the more our Savior delights to meet with us, to sympathize with us, to give mercy and grace to help in our time of need. That mercy and grace is there for us all as we continue in the house of mourning walking in unity and love together as the people of God. Last point, and I move toward a close with this. Third way to process these things biblically, let's hope in Christ, the King of justice. Let's hope in Christ, the King of justice. Because human justice is so rare and so elusive, We could easily give in to hopelessness and cynicism and despair. That is not God's will for us in Christ. And therefore, God reminds us in chapter 3, 17, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. This is a statement of his character, that the God of all the earth will do what is just and right, and it is a statement of his future activity and what he will do. God has appointed a day of justice. A day of justice is coming, and God will set all things right. That truth doesn't mean that we leave the house of mourning just yet. But it does mean that we are not only a people of sorrow, we are not only a people of righteous anger, but that in the midst of these realities, we can be today a people of hope. We look at a world of injustice and oppression, and we can know, even as we 
grieve through tears, we can know that these evils will not have the final word. In fact, the more injustice and sorrow we see in this life, the more we will treasure the God of justice and long for the world of justice that he will bring. There is much vanity under the sun. But this serves to remind us of our need for God's Son. Ecclesiastes ends in chapter 12, verse 14. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. This is the God of justice. The God of justice who will bring every deed of every person into judgment. There are those who hold theories that say the oppressed are incapable of sin and racism. The gospel tells us we are all guilty before a holy God who will bring every deed into judgment. That should be an absolutely terrifying truth for sinners and would be a frightening truth for us all were it not for the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is perfectly just and righteous. Every evil and unjust deed must be punished, including those done by me, including those done by all of us. And the reason Christ Jesus came into the world was to lay down his life in our place, to take the judgment that we deserve. In this gospel, our sins are forgiven. In this gospel, there is hope for those who have committed the greatest of injustices. I saw one written testimony of a man saying he was a former white supremacist who now has come to faith in Jesus Christ. He looks back on his life and he places himself among those groups in as such were some of you, but he has left that former life behind. However great or however small our sins may be, there is a gospel for us so that we can go to God for mercy and forgiveness. Even those who today are seeing their own sins and unjust attitudes, God is merciful to sinners. And this gospel is so rich, beyond description. I, I don't have the words to describe the glory of this gospel. In this gospel, Jesus also identifies with the millions who have been oppressed and mistreated and wrongfully imprisoned and put to death. He was born in poverty. He was denied a just trial physically mistreated, tortured, and unjustly put to death. He knows what it's like to be a victim of injustice. He knows what it's like to suffer in the hands of a corrupt system. He is not far removed from the injustice and oppression of our world, but he entered into it, and he himself experienced it so that he might by his power, deliver us from all injustice and all oppression forever. This is the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we have, however great, our sorrows and pain. Here's Philip Riken again. He says, rather than simply getting angry and sad about all the oppression we see in the world, we can trust God to make things right in the end. He says, this does not mean that there is never a time for us to pursue justice. Indeed, we, we must pursue justice. He says, yet even our best efforts will not bring an end to all oppression. There will be violence against women and children, structures of corruption in business, government, and even law enforcement. But in all the situations that we do not have the power, the authority, or the wisdom to resolve, God will see to it that justice is done. Our confidence does not lie in a justice system, but in the chief justice himself, Jesus Christ. He will bring final justice. 
Therefore, we live in the sure hope and certain expectation of His great day. Christian, live that way. Place your hope in the chief justice himself, Jesus Christ, the one who will bring final justice. Live in that sure hope. Allow that hope to wash over your soul today. Anticipate that great and glorious day that is coming. I encourage you, I exhort you, don't let the darkness steal your song. Do not let your faith in Christ be removed or shaken. Our confidence lies in Jesus Christ. And even as we lament injustice, even as we long for and pursue true justice, we do not lose sight of this hope, this sure and confident hope that reminds us it will not always be this way. We know that. One day it will be so much better beyond all comparison. You know that day that is coming. And I guarantee you, none of us, when we get to heaven, will say, you know, the societal justice here kind of reminds me of life in America. You're not going to say that. And I say that not to bash a country I am grateful for, but to exalt a far better country, to exalt the heavenly homeland in which we will soon dwell, all because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, our Savior. God has not left you without hope. We hope in Christ, the King of justice. I've gone so far over, I don't even know if anyone's still watching the live stream anymore. I close with this. Throughout Ecclesiastes, that word, Vanity and futility, you may know. It's mentioned 38 times. Vanity, vanity, futility. All is futility. All is vanity. That's the same word Paul uses in Romans 8.20 when he speaks of creation being subjected to futility or vanity. We heard that scripture read earlier. And the book of, Ecclesi and the book of Ecclesiastes was probably in view when Paul wrote those verses. Hear them again, just a few of those verses with Ecclesiastes in view. This is Romans 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, all of the people of God in all of their glory. For the creation was subjected to futility subjected to vanity. You see it throughout Ecclesiastes and all around us today. For the world was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For now, all creation groans, and we groan and we cry as we await that final day. But this is the hope that Jesus brings to a world of injustice. Because of him, glory awaits. Because of him, there is joy and meaning to be had in life. Because of him, justice will be done, and God will make all things right in the end. Praise God for this glorious Savior. Praise God for Jesus Christ who comforts us today and has promised that he will not rest until he has established justice in all the earth. Amen.